Hey, Dr. Joe here. I wanted to talk today about the number one question I've been getting lately, which is obviously related to the pandemic, and that's going to be, should I get the vaccine? And are you recommending people get the vaccine? And, and unfortunately, there's really not a blanket statement that I can give, and, and that would probably piss off some colleagues of mine that are, are very, very, very um, solid, strong advocates of vaccination. And it would also piss off another set of my colleagues that are very um, anti-vax. And, um, you know, there's people that just think you're dumb um, if you want to figure it out, you know what I mean? And, and so I really don't want to get any discussion on the polar ends of this debate, but I really just want to uh, inform you on some key concepts. And so a story that I want to share with you that I think is super relevant to getting the conversation going is a colleague of mine um, and actually a, a friend of mine, a distant friend of mine from my hometown is a uh, prominent, uh, working at a prominent hospital in the Midwest, one of the most well-known hospitals in all of the world, really. And she very strongly is advocating for vaccine. And, and it makes sense, okay? And I'm definitely not taking away from people that are advocating for vaccine. And so she described herself on a, a public social media post getting a vaccine and then went on days later to describe the reaction she had, which is basically just soreness in her arm. Because a lot of people want to know, hey, are, how did you have a bad reaction to it? You know, And so she was just sharing with us that she hadn't. But then she also shared with us some colleagues of hers that got vaccines all over the country because they're all on the front line and working in emergency departments and hospitals. And so they, they're the front line getting the vaccine. And um, a number of her colleagues, maybe a handful or so, I can't remember the exact number, had had diarrhea or had insomnia or significant anxiety, shortness of breath, um, things like that. Okay, so pretty severe reactions. Uh, I don't believe anybody was hospitalized, but pretty significant reactions. And so the comment that she made, which I thought was a really um, poignant comment, which is we just don't really know who is going to have a bad reaction. And I, I, the answer to that is true. However, I would like to propose an idea that maybe we actually can figure that out. We actually can figure out on an individual basis whether or not there's a probability that the person sitting in front of you is going to have a really bad reaction to the vaccine. Um, or the person that decides not to get a vaccine may have a really bad reaction to the virus itself. So how do we figure this out and what the hell am I talking about, right? Because um, it seems like the only strategies that we've been told right now are basically stay home and um, risk isolation, um, lack of movement, excess screen time, um, things like that, uh, that are obviously really deleterious for our mental health. Um, and also uh, close your business, uh, which uh, could be very del deleterious to your, your family dynamic and in relationships and also personal health. Um, or go out and mask and social distance. Um, don't travel to see your loved ones. Um, you know, and then also potentially uh, do so and then get the vaccine. And so those are, those are all uh, strategies that, that are out there. And I don't think they're necessarily bad strategies. So it might sound like I'm being critical of strategies, but the, the conversation that hasn't been going, you know, very strongly, which is resiliency, which is, well, let's try to understand why some people have really bad reactions to this virus. And if you fall into the category of people that do, a common example of this would be something like vitamin D, right? There's a big correlation between high negative outcomes of the coronavirus and end up ending up um, that person had really low vitamin D going into it. So we're starting to hear about these things, but the question is, how do you know? Like, well, vitamin D is a very easy one, right? That's just basically getting vitamin D tested. But I wanted to share with you a paper that was written by some colleagues of mine that was published in uh, Frontiers Journal. And basically that's one of the you know, best journals to get your paper published in basically. And so basically um, the title of this paper is Reaction of Human Monoclonal Antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 Proteins with Tissue Antigens, Implications for Autoimmune Diseases. That's kind of a mouthful, right? But basically um, this, this paper is uh, exemplifying a concept that's been in the literature for a really long time called molecular mimicry. And I want to talk a little bit today about why how this is so significant. And basically what this means is the virus itself and what, they, what they've shown is that the question is, can this virus get into your body 
and generate an immune reaction? And the answer is obviously yes, right? That's why we're getting vaccinated because we're trying to generate uh, an immune reaction and immunity. But the second question is, can this virus get into your body and generate an immune reaction that actually causes you to attack your own body, healthy tissue like your brain, your lungs, your blood vessels, your mitochondria, which makes energy, your thyroid gland, your pancreas? And the answer is, this paper seems to demonstrate the idea that there is a probability, and they even qualify the percentages and quantify the percentages, that certain proteins on this virus can cause your immune system to accidentally attack itself. Now, what's the implication of this? If you develop permanent immunity to a virus or a strain of a virus due to a vaccine, which is why vaccines are so heavily promoted, which makes sense because it's, it's much better to um, fight a virus that's weak, develop an immune response, and then get exposed to the virus that's strong and have a fast reaction against it so it can't get a foothold. That's the theory of vaccines. It makes sense. And I don't even want to get into the different debates about vaccines and anti-vaxxers versus pro-vaccination. I just want to talk about the mechanism by which they work, okay? What if you made a antibody to spike protein which is the epitope or the uh, protein sequence that is in the Pfizer vaccine. And you already had antibodies to these tissues, or you had a genetic predisposition to make antibodies of these tissues. What that means is that let's say this is TPO, right? This is the most common autoimmune in the United States, which is thyroperoxidase. And this is the enzyme that converts um, or that glues iodine and tyrosine together in the thyroid gland. So when this antibody is president, uh, prevalent, excuse me, a person may develop something called a Hashimoto's disease. Now, if you take the vaccine and you have the genetic predisposition to Hashimoto's, there is a probability that your body may accidentally not only attack the vaccine, but the antibodies made may start attacking your healthy tissue. This is a big, big issue, okay? And so do you understand how big an issue this is? Okay, this means that there's a probability that a vaccine could cause autoimmunity in the person getting the vaccine. So now we're talking about thyroid autoimmunity, which typically, you know, isn't deadly unless it's Graves' disease, which can cause what's called a thyroid storm, which can lead to a stroke, okay? Um, the antibody that typically is elevated in Graves' disease is not listed on this, okay? But this is myelin basic protein, MBP, okay? There's 11% reactivity here, a 12% reactivity here, a 7% reactivity here, okay? And so, wow, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Myelin basic protein is the protein that, one of the protein that, that is attacked in multiple sclerosis. So here's the deal. Are we willing to trade the probability of a virus killing us, which is very small for the majority of the population, with another probability that the, the vaccine could create an immune reaction that could create autoimmunity in our body, which could ravage us and cr contribute to a very, very crappy quality of life decades later, extremely high medical expenses later, and all of the other crap basically that people have to deal with, with quality of life and cost of living that goes with autoimmunity that's unmitigated. And the answer is, does it look a little less straightforward now, whether or not it should be very obvious a person should get a vaccine or it should be not so obvious? Okay, so without getting into the nuances of this whole paper, I highly advise you to check it out. It really gets into the specifics of the different tissues, the methods they used, okay? The next part of the discussion that I wanted to share 
and I've got to wrap this up because it's getting dark here, okay, is how do you know? Okay, is there a way, and this is the question that my colleague kind of um, posited to all of us was basically, is there a way to know? And the answer is, I don't know for sure, but let's take a look at a couple examples, okay? We know that um, you've heard of things like uh, the cytokine storm, right? The cytokine storm where the person that had the worst COVID reaction or they, the, the worst symptoms peak during the strongest immune response. So people that already have autoimmunity, this cytokine storm comes along and just basically is like a blowtorch and gasoline put together, right? They already had the blowtorch going, but the gasoline now is just causing an explosion of autoimmunity, which some people never recover from. These are the so-called long haulers, okay? So how do I know if I'm sitting here listening to this, if I'm somebody that has a high probability of having a reaction uh, that could be bad or has a high probability of not having a reaction? Okay, and so like if you have a history of autoimmunity yourself, then you gotta be really careful in my opinion, okay? If you have a family history of autoimmunity, like MS, um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, Hashimoto's disease, celiac disease, okay, if like phospholipid syndrome, okay, if you have these types of autoimmunities or other ones, then look at all these different tissues that are listed here, okay, and then there's a bunch that are not listed. All of this entire column here are tissues in the human body that the COVID virus can cross-react with, and this paper is only measuring a few proteins. You see this? Spike protein, nucleo protein, envelope protein, and membrane protein. So those are the proteins that measure. There's way more proteins. Okay. So before I go on, I just want to say a really obvious answer to conceptually whether or not a vaccine would be in the pro column or con column in the pro column would be this. When you get the virus, you're going to get all of the proteins, right? So when you get this virus, you're going to get every protein. And so this only researched certain proteins of the human body to select proteins of the virus. So if you get vaccinated to one protein, then theoretically, your probability of developing polyautoimmunity as a result of being, being exposed to the virus could be less if you don't go into the vaccination already with polyautoimmunity. Does that make sense? Now, is there a way, if you already have autoimmunity, to assess the overall functionality of your body so that you can potentially mitigate risk of getting the vaccine so that your, um, you can be safe from the other proteins that are in the virus and only have to worry about the spike protein, which is in the Pfizer vaccine. Okay. I'm not going to talk about the other vaccine just for simplicity purposes. So the answer is there's nothing that I've seen in the literature for sure. Okay. That gives you the guarantee, but let's just take a look at a few cases here. Okay. So overall, we just want to see a really healthy immune system here. So overall, we want to just assess, in my opinion, there are some things that we really want to look at that could significantly impact your resiliency and your risk, okay? And so we want to just get a quick assessment of the immune system and try to understand history. Personal health history matters a lot, like we talked about history of autoimmunity, and other things really matter too. Like, what does your immune system look like at the time of the infection? Why is it that people with diabetes have such a high, high, high risk? Okay, and we saw earlier that the spike protein does cross-react with insulin and GAD65 and so do the other proteins. So there's a high potential for a person with diabetes to have already be inflamed and then have this virus basically kick that inflammation into high gear, which is the gasoline and the blowtorch example that we talked about, which can lead to a very negative outcome. So if you're sitting here, for example, and you have diabetes, and you know that your diabetes is already autoimmune, 
okay? And you're like, wow, I really wanna get the vaccine. Um, how do I understand? Is there anything I can kind of look at to evaluate if I'm, if there's risk factors that I can modify? Okay, and I would say there are in my opinion. So here's a couple of them. One, vitamin D is one that we talked about, but overall, we just wanna take a look at the immune response. We'll come back to this case later. Okay, let's look at this one. Okay, this person here, is actually uh, 14 years old and has thyroid autoimmunity already, okay? So we saw earlier that thyroid autoimmunity does cross-react with the COVID virus. So let me pull that up again. So thyroid autoimmunity uh, does cross-react with the COVID virus. And that's this guy right here. Okay, see that TPO right there? Okay. And then, do you see this TPO right here? I just wanna show you evidence, okay? Where theories can come from, okay? And how we work this out clinically. This is very high, the range is zero to 26 and it's 160, okay? Just kind of on the, on the, on that basis alone, we already know that this is a, a kind of, in my opinion, if I was gonna be advised this person, this could be a check in the con category of pros and cons versus getting the vaccine. Now, if this person had a family history of Hashimoto's that was severe, meaning the person their whole life was losing hair, was gaining weight, was depressed, was constipated, was lethargic, couldn't really uh, live their life's potential because their thyroid is ravaging them. They couldn't work out without getting anxiety and depression. They couldn't recover from workouts. They would gain weight very easily, have a hard time losing weight. Their hair's dry and brittle. They have complexion issues on their skin. Their hands and feet are constantly cold. Okay, they're not gonna die from thyroid autoimmunity, but they can really have a pretty uncomfortable quality of life and basically live a life that's not one that they want, okay? And so do you want to trade thyroid autoimmunity for a, a, a vaccine when your survival rate might be really, really high as it is? That's just a really important question, okay? So that's this is one example of something that I might look at when I'm advising somebody whether or not it's a good time to get the vaccine. Now, let's say I worked with this person and their thyroid autoimmunity their immune system was supported to the point where they're no, lo no longer making thyroid antibodies. And it's clear that the antibodies are normal because they're actually healthier and have immune resiliency and what's called healthy T regulatory function. And it's not because they're just depleted. Then they might actually be, if they waited until that was so, they might actually be a candidate to have a less severe response from the vaccine. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so now that when you look at white blood cells, that's what WBC here means. There's distributions of white blood cells that matter, okay? So neutrophils uh, are the most prominent type of white blood cell. Lymphocytes are the next most prominent. Monocytes are the next, eosinophils and, it is eosinophils and basophils. I'm not gonna get into what all these do necessarily, but you really just wanna see 60% here, about 30% here, about five to eight percent here, and about zero to three percent here, and zero to one percent here. So, this person looks to seem to have a pretty balanced immune response. However, if you kind of look up here, a total white blood cell count, okay, four point one. I would say that's getting to be kind of low. Okay, so this person may already have a chronic inflammatory immune-based issue. We don't know if they have autoimmunity. Okay, but we could run antibodies for different tissues. It might not surprise you that this person has autoimmunity to their small intestine. It's called celiac disease, primarily from wheat. And this person also has autoimmunity to his brain, okay? So are there any thyroid or brain autoimmunities in the COVID and in the Pfizer um, spike protein uh, 
epitope. How do I say this? Are there any cross reactivities between spike protein and brain? Yes. Does this person already have brain autoimmunity? Yes. Are there any spike protein cross reactivities potentially between that and small intestine? Well, tropomyosin could qualify for that. So the answer is yes. So this person down here looks pretty good. Okay. But up here, uh, I don't know. Now, I would go like this. How is their digestion? How is their brain? If they're actively in brain fog or if they have like digestive disturbance about an hour after they eat, that doesn't seem to get better no matter what they do. Okay. They might be in a situation where they are still immunologically active and may not be a great position to get the vaccine just based on that alone because of the inflammatory cascade that can result. Does that make sense? Now, what if this person was a first responder and was adamant that they should get the vaccine? Are there things that we can do nutritionally to serve this person to make them uh, more resilient? And the answer is absolutely there are, and that's in the literature, and that's definitely another paper that I can go through with you at another time, okay? Okay, let's look at another example here. Okay, so this is a stool test. And um, this is, again, is uh, that 14 year old. Um, and so digestive disturbance is a pretty significant part of the picture here, uh, history and thyroid autoimmunity, easily gains weight, difficulty losing weight, anxiety. Okay, and so secretory IgA is a um, immune, immune um, chemical that our body makes to help us um, at, on the surface of our body fight infection. So like, guess where we have a lot of secretory IgA? In our nose, in our sinuses. So she already is at a higher risk of developing, um, that she might sit in a room with somebody that has COVID and she may be more likely to get COVID than a person that has a really high secretory IgA, IgA reaction. That's kind of interesting, huh? Now, if we look here, I mean, interesting to know, right? Um, Calprotectin uh, is an uh, immune chemical that is elevated. This is a stool test, by the way. And so um, she already has significant immune reaction in her intestine. And this is why she has so much digestive disturbance. Um, in cases like this, this could be infection. This could be um, autoimmunity. This could be a food. Okay. And so in her case, we're looking more at an autoimmune and food mechanism, okay? And one of the foods that we found that was significantly affecting her was egg, okay? But is it possible that uh, if we ran autoimmune uh, markers on her, other than the thyroid markers that we would find tropomyosin and that could be the, the mechanism for the high calprotectin? Absolutely, okay? So would a person with acute inflammation in their intestines with active autoimmunity in an acute phase and then chronically depleted immune system, are they the ones that are most vulnerable to getting the infection? And the answer is yes. Okay, but are they also the ones that might be the most vulnerable to having a negative reaction? And the answer is a person can make a case for that. So what do you do? Well, clinically, I would wanna do some things to work and get her calprotectin down, which is what we're doing, not with the supplement, but to actually change the physiology of her body so that she no longer produces calprotectin. I'm not talking about a supplement that lowers calprotectin, okay? Change the physiology and the terrain of her body so that she no longer becomes depleted and can replete secretory IgA. I'm not talking about giving vitamin A, which can be useful as part of that strategy, okay? So this is another example of an individual that could be susceptible to a negative reaction to a vaccine. And special care to deal with resiliency around the vaccine would be super important. Okay, um, let's look at another example. Okay, so C-reactive protein is a uh, inflammatory marker and it's called cardiac because when we see elevated C-reactive protein, a cardiovascular event like a stroke um, is imminent. That's how severe this marker is, okay? So this person's C-reactive protein is 45 
0.84, okay? And the typical range ideally is zero to three. This is a massive, massive issue. And, and this person is in a, an acute flare or was in an acute flare of rheumatoid arthritis. The RA was flared up and then she also had a, a candida overgrowth that was contributing to this, okay? So now you have acute infection that's kicking the immune system in gear. You have autoimmunity, why, which her, her bones are already remodeled. She's limping. She has uh, bony de osseous deformities in her hands and her knees. Okay. And now she gets a COVID vaccine. And then she has an immunological inflammatory reaction to the vaccine when she's already immunologically inflamed. So is that a good idea? I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. So, um, this is what her, that was in October. Um, this was in January. So we've worked with, worked with her and we're able to get her acute inflammation down, um, from 45 to 12. And she does feel a little bit better. Okay. But look, look at how far she has to go. Okay. So she might not feel awesome or even a little better like significantly better, I should say, until it gets less than three. So isn't it important to know that we can do labs to measure progression of this stuff rather than just guess? Okay. So again, this person has rheumatoid arthritis. Her infection is now resolved. Her CRP or acute inflammatory proteins coming down. Her cardiovascular risk is dropping exponentially, basically. And um, we can feel really good about what's happening in her case. She's also feeling better, but she may not feel a lot better until this gets down. Now, this also suggests that she had significant ramping up of a loop, okay? And there's a name for this. It's called NF-kappa-B. And this is a self-amplifying plastic loop, meaning she isn't just going to be able to go back to the way her life was before it got this elevated, she's going to likely need some level of anti-inflammatory to keep herself from flaring up completely again. She's just not going to be able to stop doing what she's doing and go back to a regular lifestyle. Um, she's going to need to be very careful with her food plan. She's going to be need to be very careful about um, limiting her uh, exposure to illnesses that could flare her up. She needs to be really careful about managing her food and her microbiome so that candida doesn't flare up again. Otherwise, she could end up exacerbating this loop. Okay, a um, couple more here, just to just to kind of exemplify the the concept here. Okay, so this person um, also this is the the woman that also had rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, and so you can see that although her CRP is down significantly from 45 to roughly 12, and we want to get it less than three, we can see that those neutrophils are higher than where we want them to be. And we can see that our lymphocytes are lower than where we want them to be. We want those to be roughly 30. We want the neutrophils to be roughly 60 to 62, maybe 58 to 62. We want these monocytes to be somewhere between five and eight. So basically what this means is she has tissue debris still. She's in an active inflammatory response that's immune mediated. Again, is she a candidate for a vaccine at this time? If I was advising her, and if she asked me, I would say, I would really wanna see your CRP less than three. I'd wanna see your neutrophils in the optimal range. I'd wanna make sure that you're not having any evidence of tissue debris. And if we wait until those things happen before you get the vaccine, you're going to be much less likely to have a reaction. Still, it doesn't prove that she's not gonna have a reaction. Remember, she has a plastic permanent amplification of an inflammatory loop that can be very sensitive. Okay, let's look at another example. Okay, this individual uh, is in his 60s. He survived prostate cancer. So, all right, does he already have issues with significant uh, immune issues making him vulnerable? And does he have issues potentially with inflammation? Um, or deb tissue debris or things that might uh, compete against what his body needs to do against the virus. So he actually would be a candidate potentially for a vaccine because we don't want him to have to fight every single epitope of that vaccine. If we can really just limit it to one really weak virus, if his immune system's already kind of down and out, might we want to um, do something 
to help him? And the answer is, okay, we can see that he's got some tissue debris here. We can see that his neutrophils are, you know, definitely less than 55. So he's having a hard time resolving a chronic inflammatory response. However, he doesn't seem to be depleted in his white blood cell count. So although he's got some debris happening, you know, I might recommend that it would be a good time for him to get a, a vaccine, even though he's got some unresolved chronic inflammation, if we can do some things to support his immune system around the vaccine, okay? So he has a healthy inflammatory response, a healthy resolution phase of that inflammation, and then his immunity to the virus. Um, there's one other uh, case I wanted to show you uh, of an example of uh, somebody that might, you know, want to consider strongly whether or not to get the vaccine. So just give me one second here. Okay. So last, last example here. Okay. Last two examples. All right. So here we go. So what is this? Okay. This is mold. Okay. So See how the range is zero to 1.9 and this person's at 74.3? That's significantly elevated, right? So there's a little bit, I don't wanna to get too much into this, okay? But some people will tell you that an IgG reaction is just normal because it means you've been exposed to it. And that's true, okay? But we also know now that if, if this number, which is an IgG, which is a type of immune reaction, this is the type of reaction that we want to get when we get vaccinated. Okay, we want to develop a, a long IgG reaction so that uh, we have a quick reaction to um, the virus should we get exposed to it, so it can't proliferate and make us really sick. Okay, this here um, tells us when it's more than five times the range. Okay, that it's an active deal, okay? And so if you're in the medical industry and you're watching this and you're like, bullshit, okay? Just go look it up, seriously. This is a really important concept. And I'm saying that kindly because I didn't know this. And when I figured this out, it was a really big breakthrough in my ability to help people, okay? So um if it's more than five times the range, you're looking at an active infection due to something called class switching. Okay, we don't make what are called IgM antibodies anymore, except for at the beginning of an infection. And then we make only IgG antibodies, except for certain rare occasions, okay? So, or certain parts of the body. But in the blood, basically, when you see an IgG that's over, you know, five times the range, you're looking at an active infection that's chronic, okay? So this person's dealing with this many most of these are exceeding that number, right? Five times. And so this person's likely to already have an immune system that's really compromised or busy. I wouldn't say compromised. It's actually doing really well because it's making all these antibodies. But this person may not do particularly well um, getting the virus, and they may not do particularly well with the vaccine. Okay? So it's just another example of a case history uh, uh, when somebody would ask me, well, do I get the virus or not get the virus? Uh, excuse me, do I get the vaccine or do I not get the vaccine? And, you know, it's, it's not as simple as a blanket, easy, everybody should do it or nobody should do it. And this, the moral righteous high ground and all this stuff really doesn't have a place uh, in a complete medical workup. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the last one. Okay, this individual um, comes in and uh, has brain autoimmunity, okay, causing depression, anxiety, insomnia, or had also had multiple concussions, and so um, had gone through uh, a program and resolved uh, their concussion symptoms, and basically um, did some follow up labs, and this is the last lab that we did, okay. And you can see here that white blood cell count looks really good at 6.5. Um, neutrophils look almost perfect. Lymphocytes look almost perfect. Monocytes look perfect. Eosinophils and basophils look perfect. They essentially have no symptoms anymore. And they 
are in a great position here, particularly if their vitamin D looks really good, their CRP looks normal, um, their ferritin and iron looks normal, they're in a great position to tolerate this vaccine. They have uh, uh, no family history of autoimmunity, but they just have a personal history of autoimmunity. That's the only question would be, is the personal history of autoimmunity. That said, if you have a personal history of autoimmunity, it might be advantageous to get a vaccine with one epitope or one antigen that we can make an antibody to to help us kill the entire virus and take our chances with all those tissues that could potentially react in our body to that uh, particular antigen in the virus. Or it might be advantageous to not get the vaccine and just really try to do a good job not getting the virus. But what's the probability that we're not going to get the virus? I think it's pretty small, right? I think most of us are going to get, we've, most of us have probably been exposed to the virus or already have had it. So that brings up the last point that I want to make, which is get tested for the antibodies to COVID, SARS COVID-2 vaccine or antibodies before you get the vaccine. Like you might've already had it. The number one symptom of having this virus is no symptoms, okay? One out of six people in the US have autoimmunity, which means way higher number have reactions to tissue that hasn't become autoimmunity yet. There is a probability you're one of those people. There is a way to determine if you have resiliency, immune resiliency, or there's a way to determine risk factors that would suggest a vaccine or another inflammatory event could create serious havoc on your body. And there is a way to mitigate these variables so that the timing of vaccination is less risky. And that's what I wanted to share with you. So that basically answers the question. And I think it's possible. So thank you for your time. I know this is a little bit longer of a video. It was longer than I set out to make it, but here's the reality. We're talking about a pandemic. We're talking about a severe thing. And it's not easy to just boil down yes or no responses to really complex questions. And I think um, I would love to see more people conversing and trying to understand the physiology involved here and creating strategies that make sense for the individual and also doing so in a way that allows us to still be responsible for the collective good. And I think that's possible by using some of the, um, by implementing some of the ideas that I shared with us here today. And so um, I'm really pumped that the research is there to help us get these conversations going. And I look forward to catching you on the next video. Take care.